I want to show you some things here this morning about your Lord Jesus and what is happening in the earth today with the church. I want to have you go to, to Matthew chapter 12. I want to encourage you out of this, this chapter about our Lord. And uh, we're going to be connecting the Lord this morning with, with Solomon of old, King Solomon. Now, in the beginning, King Solomon was so good. And then he fell off the band, he fell off the wagon, and he got involved with all kinds of stuff with women and idol worship and false gods. And, got a, and, and yet we have an indication, you know, if you read all the books that Solomon wrote, like Ecclesiastes and Proverbs and so forth, some of those, that in the end, he, he, kinda, he finally got it right. He came back. He said, I've gone through all of this, and now I look, and the only thing that matters is to worship God and love him wholly. And here's the wisest man that ever existed upon the earth until the Lord Jesus, that man, walked the earth. Amen. And the one that we worship is greater than Solomon. Here in Psalm, or in, in Matthew chapter 12, in verse 38, I'm just going to read a few verses and then we'll, we'll get into this. But certain scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would like to see a sign from you. And he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Now, God's all into about signs and wonders. But if that's all you seek, you're missing it. And the devil will accommodate you. He will give you a sign or a wonder. If that's all you're seeking, rather than the God of the sign or wonder. You got to get the order right. You seek the God of the signs and wonders. You don't seek the signs and wonders. Amen. So Jesus is telling them this because this is what they're after. The Jews always want a sign. The Gentiles always want wisdom, college education, intellect. Thank you for the amens. It's true. And you know, that's what, what he says. But who does God choose? Well, he chooses people that you and I wouldn't choose. He chooses people like me, like you. You say, who are those? Well, uh, the foolish and despised and nobodies. And the down and outs, that's who God chooses. And there are a few, there are a few noble, there are a few, there's a few, you know, thank God for the, Paul was one of the few. He was a brainiac. I mean, if he was living the day, he'd have a dozen degrees. He was brilliant. I mean, absolutely brilliant. I mean, uh, fantastic. But anyway, he so loved the Lord. He was so childlike. He was like Ariel running around over here. Anyway, so look at this. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation. So at the last generation when men stand before God, and this generation that were living in the time when the Lord Jesus was here on the earth, the men of Nineveh will also come forth and stand with them before the judgment throne of God. And this is what they'll do. They will condemn that generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Man, I mean, Jonah was a tremendous, great prophet. I mean, he had to get it right, you know. <laughs> And he missed it. He was running from God. This is the beauty of our God. He, he gives us a second chance, right? Yeah, he and and he'll, he'll work it on our behalf. He's good. He's that loving. He's that kind. So he gave Jonah another chance. And Jonah, well, he, you know, he changed his mind after three days down there in the bottom of the ocean, you know, in a, in a fish's belly. And so he comes back out and he preaches in Nineveh. And, and they repent. But there's a greater than Jonah who's come to us. And then look at this. The queen of the south, which you know to be the queen of Sheba, shall rise in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is referring to himself, of course. A greater than Solomon is here. A greater than Jonah has come. And he's saying that this woman, this great queen that lived in that day, came from the farthest parts of the earth to come to hear the wisdom of a man. Can, can, you, can, you, can you grasp that? 
that in Solomon's time, people came from all over the then known world to sit at his feet and hear him discuss and talk and bring judgment? I mean, you know, we're, we're happy if somebody crosses the street to come hear us. You know? Amen. Glory. <laughs> but, uh, but Jesus is telling us that, that a greater than Solomon is here. And, of course, we marvel at the wisdom of Solomon, all the Proverbs he wrote, all of the things he uttered, all of the, If you've ever read Ecclesiastes, if you've read the Proverbs, uh, it, you know, if you've read about him in, in the books of the Chronicles of the Kings and so forth, he had a, he had a wisdom that, beloved, there was no question. Not, none of us put together could match him in intellect and in answers. And you could bring before him the hardest questions, the most detailed, complex, introverted, extroverted, intricate types of questions, and he would just be able to unravel them and give answers. And, and I mean, and, and he's actually praised, you know, to think how blessed such a man and how blessed such a people to be able to come and hear such a man. Think about that. And, and so the reason I'm pointing this out to you is because living in our day today, we have someone who's in our midst. His name is Jesus, who's both greater than Jonah, who can preach. And Jonah's, I think his, his message was five words. I think it was five words. You want to check that out for me? It was like five words, something about, you know, repent. And God, or God will destroy you. Five words. Do you think you can go through a city? I guess the maybe, maybe the city of Nineveh might have had a, maybe 100,000, 200,000 inhabitants. And he just walked the streets. Forty days, Nineveh destroyed. Was that it? Forty days, Nineveh destroyed. And they repented. They even made the donkeys and the animals fast and not eat. I mean, man, what a word. What a word. And, th and this is this... This, this prophet who was running from God, running from God. And, and people all the time, you hear testimonies all the time, how they ran from God, they run from God. And finally God catches them and, and, and things start changing in their lives. You know, so, so, so this is this beautiful story. And then, then Solomon, and I want you to catch this. Now, to, to, to appreciate this, I'm going to take you uh, into the Old Testament because you've got to see this. Uh, I don't know if you're impressed yet, with Solomon, but I want you to see this because in 1 Kings chapter 10, go to 1 Kings chapter 10 because I want to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Wow. Solomon is reigning, he's king. David has passed on, he's with the Lord. Solomon, his son, sits on the throne. Solomon has built the temple. Solomon has built his own house. Solomon has built the millo, the milla. The, Solomon has built uh, the treasure city. Solomon has built the, the stables for his uh, chariots, 40,000 chariots, 40,000 chariots. Uh, he has 12,000 cavalrymen for his horses. He's built the stables for his t horses his chariots, his cavalry, his soldiers. He, he is the most magnificent king, the most wealthy king that has ever lived upon the face of the earth. He has such riches, beloved, as you read about Solomon, that silver was accounted as nothing in the days of Solomon because they had gold. And everything was made of gold. Everything was made of gold. All his drinking vessels, all the money, all the instruments in temple worship, no silver. It was all gold. He had the finest of everything, finest in, in materials to build the temple, finest in, in apparel to clothe the priests. Uh, his own robes are most glorious. That's why Jesus said, look, a lily of the field, if, you'll, if you can receive it, is of greater glory than the way Solomon was attired. And a Solomon was attired, you have to think about it. Let me just explain a little bit. He was dressed in these immaculately white robes. 
And then they would begin to add color of scarlet and purple. In those robes were writ was woven threads of gold. Minute little, think of a thread, and threads of gold were woven through the material. Real gold, real threads of gold were woven through the material. He wore a mitre, a diadem that would equal that of the high priest. I want you to understand, you know, what we're talking about here with Solomon being the wisest and the richest man that God has ever had upon the face of the earth. And Jesus, our Lord, comes who's greater than Solomon, doesn't come that way. He comes as a humble king riding on a donkey. But you have to see Solomon. God wants you to see Solomon the way he was. And this wisdom that, that was the wisdom of God that he gave to a man. And that's why, you know, when I pray, and I hope you pray, that you ask for the wisdom of God. James tells us to ask for the wisdom of God for our lives. So that he may impart to us and show us things and both move us into things and keep us out of things. That we may ob obtain that which God has for us. And so wisdom, the, the, the wisdom of Solomon was phenomenal. And, and here in 1 Kings 10... Uh, I want you to see the fame of Solomon has gone out to all the world. How wise he is, how rich he is, how glorious he is. And people, this was, this was the, uh, the height of the kingdom of Israel. When both kingdoms were united, both Israel and Judah, this is the height of their existence under the reignship of Solomon. No other king ever equaled Solomon, either wisdom or riches. This is the very creme de la creme of the ancient empire of, of Israel, the nation of Israel. And Solomon reigns over it. And so his fame, can, can you imagine kings and queens coming and sitting at your feet to hear what you have to say about, uh, well, t tell us about the, 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 the lilies of the field. And Solomon could just begin to elaborate on the lilies of the field. Or tell, talk to us about the birds of the air. And he could just begin to talk about what kind of bird is that? Well, that's that bird and this is what it does. And this is its, its, its color. This is the way it flies. This is the way it raises its young. Could you imagine? No wonder they said, blessed are the people who sit at your feet. And who hear your wisdom. Because people who walk with wise people become wise if they really listen. So the Queen of Sheba, here she comes, verse 1, 1 Kings 10. She heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. Whew, that's what we want. We want fame concerning the name of the Lord, right. what he is, what he does for us. Yeah. Beloved, God is not glorified by you being sick, poverty-stricken, depressed, deceived, none of that. He's not glorified in any of that. He wants you to walk with him in his wisdom yeah. and get him fame in the earth. Yeah. Whew. Man, I like that. So she came to prove him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train. Now, not a choo-choo train. Um, a, 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 a retinue. A retinue. You know, all of these servants, all of these people who wait on her. I mean, hundreds of them. No woman, no, a, a never did another king monarch ever come to Solomon like the Queen of Sheba. She came with hundreds of servants. A train, think of a spread out train, camels and donkeys loaded with every kind of goodness you can think of in those days. Look at this, man, it just, with camels that bear spices, very much gold, precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. Man, she just poured out her heart to him. And Solomon told her of all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king, which he 
told her not. It didn't make any difference what she talked about. She was, he was able to plunge the depth of it right to her heart and answer her. Sounds like somebody I know sees, but he's greater than Solomon. I want, I want you to get the picture of the greater one in reading about this natural man clothed with the Spirit of God and filled with the wisdom of God. I want you to get the connection of the greater one than Solomon who's with you so that when you come to him with your hard questions and, oh, God, why? He knows. He can answer you. He can help you. And the Queen of Sheba, verse 4, when she had seen all of Solomon's wisdom. Now, now catch this. When she had seen all of Solomon's wisdom and the house he had built and the meat of his table and the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers and their clothing and his cupbearers and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. Can you imagine that? There was no more spirit in her. Just took her breath away. She's, she's stunned. That this is exactly what the Lord is trying to communicate to you and me. This woman looking at this man Solomon and seeing all of these things, she's stunned. She's a queen. She's got riches and, and wealth and, and power untold in her kingdom. And yet when she looks at Solomon, she is stunned. It says here she's without breath. It says her her spirit. Don't you love that there was no more spirit in her? She just she's just kind of looking around, you know, she's she's staggering. She's and you have to understand, I'm gonna explain this a little bit to you, but but she's looking at this, and, and, and let's just go ahead and read it. And she said to the king, It was a true report, a true report that I heard in my own land of your acts and your wisdom. Wow. How be it, I believe not the words until I came and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame which I heard. Happy. Happy are thy men. Happy are thy servants which stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Howbeit, I believe not the words until I came and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. I just can't get over that. Verse 7, the half was not told me. You ever heard that expression? The half was not told me. And I'm trying to communicate to you all your hearts, beloved. You haven't seen anything yet. The half has not been showing you what's coming. The glory and the power and the riches and the wealth and the wisdom that is coming to the church. Not the carnal church as it's been. No, none of that. No, this end time bride is without spot or blemish or wrinkle or anything like that. She's most glorious. I'm trying to, I want you to be strengthened in the Lord. I want your hearts to leap in faith and take hold of this one greater than Solomon. And that you would come and stand in the presence of this Holy One who's greater than Solomon. Because you know what will happen? You'll be happy. <laughs> you, will be, you will be happy. 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 I think I, and it's not just happy. It's like 5-5. Five, five. You know, it's like grace, grace. You know, happy, happy. Happy, happy. Glory to God. I got to get me a t-shirt. Happy. Happy. Yeah. They got them. They just haven't ordered one. Anyway, happy. 
happy. Why aren't some Christians happy? Oh, Lord God. Uh, blessed. Look what she says. Happy are your men, happy your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Verse 9, blessed be the Lord your God. That's what it results in praises to God. Blessed be the Lord God, which delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you a king to do judgment and justice. Isn't that something? See, some of you missed that because you're, you're occupied with the little one over here. But you, you go, make sure you go back and read it. Because of, of what God had done for this man, everybody in his kingdom entered into it. What God had done for this man. And, and the thing about Solomon, you know, it's, it's the greatest glory and it's the greatest tragedy in Solomon. Because Solomon started so good, and he did so well, and we're told twice, and Scripture really makes a point of this. It's really, really phenomenal. Twice in a positive connection context, and once in a negative context. And twice in a positive context, it says that the Lord appeared to Solomon. Right. Can you believe that? In the Old Testament, the Lord appeared. You know, it'd be, you know, you and I would be writing our book, wouldn't we? You know, if the Lord appeared to us once. I hear people say, the Lord appeared to me, and yet, you know, it's like ho-hum. I'm thinking, Lord God, the Lord Jesus, the, the king, the, the ruler of the universe appears to you, and it's ho-hum. I'm saying, you didn't see the Lord. You might have saw an angel of light. I don't know. Right, right. Woo! Wow. There's getting some stuff released this morning. <laughs> because there's a crown, and then there's... Should I say it? Clowns? There's, there's those who wear the crowns of the highest echelon of the Lord, and there are those who are clowns. And they're being exposed for what they are because they're unclean, they're godless, they have no heart for Him. And so they're being exposed for what they are. And this will increase as we move. The sons of light and the sons of darkness are going to be, you'll see this. Uh, Jesus said, and then when it comes to the end, the Lord will send forth his angels and he'll cut them out, the wicked out, and the holy will be brought into the harvest. But, but it's true. So anyway, not, notice this here. Man, oh man, what, what a story. You know, so here's Solomon, and a greater than Solomon is with you and me. And, and I hope that you can see, because Solomon is a type of Christ. In the beginning, Solomon is a type of Christ. And of course, it's the Lord Christ. The, the, it's called a theophany in the Old Testament, called a theophany, where God appears to man, uh, or in the shape or form of a man. So this is the pre-incarnate Christ appearing to Solomon twice, and we're told that, and spoke to him directly. In a negative context, later, after Solomon has fallen... And has his 700 wives and his uh, 300 concubines, or if it's the other way around, I don't, you know, and he gets into idol worship and he worships all the, the false gods where they sacrifice their children and, and uh, you know, the, all the things that they do. And he was involved in all of that. It says in a negative context, after listing all of that, how he's fallen, and it says, This is the man to whom Lord appeared twice. So here what you have is a picture of Christ and his church in the last day. You got a picture of Christ Jesus and his church in the last day. And I want you to notice, because the Lord brings it out here, that the thing that's going to wrap around the church and be permeating in the church is the wisdom of God. And, and this isn't man's wisdom. You see, there's, there's man's wisdom and there's God's wisdom. It's like there's man's love and then there's God's love. You know, the, the two aren't the same. Come on. See? No, they're, they're not the same. I mean, you know, we, we hear about man's love all the time. It's usually spelled L-U-S-T. It's the Hollywood kind, you know, lust. That's their love. 
and they kill for it, and they cheat for it, and they, they destroy people's lives for it. But God's love is pure and holy. There, there's an element that, that lifts, always lifts the human spirit and mind, the love of God. It is something that is beyond earth. It cometh down from the Father of lights. And it comes present in the Holy Spirit, you see. So one of the fruits of the Spirit is love. And it's always first, and it has to be first, because love, joy, peace, long-suffering. You won't find the others if you don't find the love. No. Uh -uh. So what we have here is this beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus and his church at the end of time. And the first thing that's going to fill the house of the Lord in these last days is going to be the Lord's wisdom. And it's a divine wisdom to know what's right and wrong, what's of God and what is not. It's a wisdom that will cause you to prosper rather than uh, to be stricken with tragedy, uh, to experience failure. It's a wisdom that will carry you and protect you. Uh, this is the Lord's wisdom. This is the wisdom that Solomon had in the beginning. And there was no, by the way, there was no king or kingdom who attacked Solomon in those days. They wouldn't dare because he had such wisdom about, about warfare and battle and what to do with cavalry or chariots or with his foot soldiers, you know, and, you know, they wouldn't dare. And the Lord God also put his fear on all the other kingdoms right. and, and they wouldn't dare attack. So this wisdom, the second thing I want you to see here, <clears throat> and, and, it, and it just shows up in verse three about this wisdom is there wasn't anything that was hid from the king. And in these last days with the Lord's church, this beautiful gift of revelation is going to come in its fullness. And that's really important for you to understand. You know, the gifts of revelation are really going to come in their fullness. I keep telling you this. I know it frightens some of you. And, and you won't show up for the prophetic because it frightens you. But you're running from your very deliverance in what is coming to the church in the last days in the prophetic. The prophetic always carries this, the gifts of revelation. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. You're going to have your seers, S-E-E-R, who are able to see, and they become the eyes of the church. And because of that, you'll be protected, you'll be kept, because there will not be anything to be hid, hidden. My dear friend, Paul Cain, he, he actually asked the Lord to deliver him of this. He had that to such a degree, he could not sit next to somebody and not know what they were thinking. You say, oh, I'll give it to me. Well, I, I want it too, but I, 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 do you understand what kind of a burden that would be? Because he not only knew if they had talked good about him, he also knew if they had talked bad about him. And were feigning, oh, it's so good to see you, brother, brother Paul. And behind, you know, there were a Judas. And he would instantly know it. He would know if they were involved in pornography. He would know if they were involved in drugs. He would know, you know, it would just, he would just know. And I remember him talking to Mike Bickle. And Mike saying, well, Paul said, let's, let's go pray for these people. You know that about them and you know that about them. And Paul says, no, 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 no. He said, the Lord, the Lord isn't wanting me to do that. He said, I know this about most people under, under this gift. He said, it's just that I'm the Lord's friend. And because I'm the Lord's friend, the Lord tells me these things. And, and the church in these last days is going to be the Lord's friend. To such, to such a level that the Lord can, can, can tell his heart to them. And he can tell you the hearts and the secrets of other people and you won't crush them or kill them. Rather, you'll pray for them and bring them deliverance. You won't speak evil of them and destroy them. Are you ready for that kind of church? I'm, I'm praying to be ready. I'm praying to be ready. When that kind of holiness and fear of the Lord comes and revelation comes, I'm praying to be ready. Yeah. So anyway, let me just, we were up with Chris yesterday, Pastor Chris Reed. Of course, he operates in a real uh, great level uh, of word of knowledge. Uh, and uh, we were sitting there and I, uh, uh, he suddenly, uh, Dan Reese, the prophet Dan Reese was speaking that morning, but, but Chris was ministering and there was a couple sitting right over here like where chess is. And, and he said, you know, I'm drawn to you. And he said, you know, 
there's, there's, I, I, you know, he kind of laughed. He says, I see Harlem Globetrotters. Now, how many of you know who the Harlem Globetrotters are? You know, everybody knows about who the Harlem Globetrotters are. And he said, well, you know, you know, when they would handle the basketball or when they would dribble, you know, with such, with such precision and such excellence. And he says, I, I really see that about you. He said, is there anything about, about the Globetrotters about you? And they're both kind of chuckling, you know, because, well, they said, our ministry is da-da-da-da-da Globetrotters. <laughs> they're a husband and wife team, ministry team. And our ministry is called something, I didn't catch the first part of it, something da-da-da-da Globetrotters. And he said, oh, okay. So he said, so then he began to minister to them prophetically. And he began to name some other things off, some people and friends and family and call them out by name and all that. But the thing is, you know, it just, it just thrills you because the God of heaven can give that kind of gifting to a man or a woman and can make that kind of connection with them. And immediately they were drawn. It was the first time they were in that service. They'd never been to that church before. And immediately they were drawn in to what the Lord was saying. Amen. That the Lord knew about them. And cared about them. And loved them. Even knew their ministry. And you see, what you don't understand, some of you do, you got it. But this is coming to the whole church. Right. It's coming to the whole church. Those, and I'll qualify it, those who are ready for it, prepared for it. So you have to understand what God is doing with his church today. And, and it's by grace. It's by his spirit. We just keep walking with the Holy One. We just keep pursuing his heart. We just stay after him. He, he's going to cause it to happen. No man causes this to happen. Right. You know, no man brought this to Solomon. Right. No man did this for Solomon. No, huh? No, this came down from heaven. The Lord appeared to him twice. He said, okay, I'm going to give you a wisdom unlike anything that's ever been upon the earth. And because of that, and you didn't ask me for riches, I'm going to give you riches. Go back and read those two appearances. It'll, it'll thrill your heart. So here, here he's answering all these questions. Then begin to look, just look at this. Notice it says in verse 4, she saw his wisdom and the house that he built. You know, if Solomon had built his own house, it, it must have been something out of this world. It, it, there's some descriptions of it. Uh, it just, it was phenomenal. She's, it's actually mentioned in Scripture. It's so phenomenal. You know, the house he built, and then the meat of his table. In, in verse 5, the meat of his table. You know, the food of his table. And, and just think, uh, think of the most sumptuous, luxurious, um, most abundant feast banquet, uh, dinner you've ever been to, and just start multiplying that by maybe 10 or 20 or maybe by 100 times greater. Just picture the table dressed in pure white and it all laid out in gold. Maybe peacocks are walking around the outer fringes of the table. I mean, folks, there was nothing. She, her breath's taken away. You know, it wasn't any of this redneck, redneck stuff, you know. You know, well, here, here's a fork. and Oh, yeah, here's a plate, too. Enjoy the paper. You know, it wasn't any of that stuff. Hello. And now, I, I want you to see it. God wants you to see it. This man had something of a level that is coming to the church because the food that the church is going to offer in these last days is from his banquet table. And he says in Psalm 23 that we eat of it. And we're going to offer it. And then it says here, the sitting of his servants. What is that? The, the seating of his servants. Well, it's not just what they sat on, which were like thrones. And have you ever, did you read about the, the description of Solomon's throne? It was pure ivory. He had this great, and it was, it was crowned at the top like an arch. And it's all pure ivory and has armrests. It's pure ivory, ivory and, it's, and it's trimmed in pure gold. And on either side, there are six lions and six lions. And the steps leading up to his throne are all paved in ivory and gold. There wasn't another throne like it that's ever been upon the face of the earth. And so, you know, Queen of Sheba sees that. And you know, he's sitting up there and the way he's all decked out. And, and she's, you know, whoa, whoa. You know, what have I gotten myself into? And I want to tell you, that's the way I am. I see the King of Kings. I see him seated on his throne. I'm thinking, Lord God, what have I got myself into? Yeah. 
And I come boldly to that throne because I'm after both mercy and grace. And then notice, notice this. It says here, even his waiters, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters. You know, think of all the butlers. Think, he had thousands of them. Thousands of them. And they're all carrying trays and, and dishes, you know, the purest of this and the purest of that. There is no silver. It's gold this. It, it's, it's tapestry that. But it, it's far beyond anything you and I have ever saw. Uh, Cindy and I, when we were in England, or were you with me on that trip? We saw the crown jewels. In England, we went in London. You can go down to the Tower Castle where they keep all the crown jewels that have been in England. And all of these rubies and diamonds and then the crowns of the monarchs down through the ages. And it does take your breath away. You're looking at these crowns and they're just encrusted with diamonds and rubies and emeralds and every kind of precious stone. And it's nothing compared to what Solomon had. Golden scepters down there in case. And you've heard of the Lord with Esther, the Lord stretching forth his scepter, a golden scepter. The Lord's scepter is a scepter of righteousness, we're told. It's a golden scepter. And, and, and I saw these golden scepters of the monarchs of England, and they're nothing compared to what Solomon had. You know, the Lord wants us, our hearts to be thrilled by, by what's being described here because this is your Jesus. And this is a picture of the church in the last days. Come on, man. Hallelujah. Notice this. You know, the servants talks about their, their attendance. So, you know, that's all the things that they're doing. They're carrying their, you know... The, all the things they're attending to with Solomon, their apparel. You have to understand that the servants, the servants of, of Solomon were dressed like kings. So when Queen of Sheba was looking at the butlers and the maidens, they're dressed like kings and queens, and yet they're serving you, a, you know, a hamburger. You know, no, no, no. They're serving you something on a golden platter and handing you a golden cup to drink from. No kingdom like this. God wants to dress you in his righteousness. You get a revelation of he wants to dress you in his armor. He wants to dress you in humility. He wants to dress you in his light, you know. Because if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. It's all about the light. Yeah. Come on. Walking in light. Yeah. Being light. Yeah. To all those around us. Right. The whole known world heard about Solomon and they came to him. That's the church in the last days. Men and women, boys and girls, so full of Christ. That they emanate his light. They may get slapped around and pushed and, and criticized, but just the love of God pours out of them. The rioters in the streets become the next Apostle Paul's, Aquila and Priscilla's, because they manifest the love of Christ. They're pure, they're holy. The pure in heart will see God, and, and the end time church is going to see God. Before we see God, we're going to see God. I keep telling you. It's here. The cupbearers, verse 5. The cupbearers, you know. So remember Joseph and the cupbearer in prison? The cupbearer. Cupbearers, Nehemiah was a cupbearer, very, a very significant position uh, in, old, in, in, in ancient history. If you were a cupbearer, you stood before the king and you handed him his cup. You tasted the wine before he drank it. Make sure there was no, nothing in there. And then you handed him the cup and served him. And, and, and we're going to be handing. Do you, you, do you get the picture? You're going to be handing people the new wine. You're going to hand them the new wine. The wine of his heart. The wine of his spirit. You know, you're, you're going to be handing them. 
his word, the revelation of it in these last days. And it's, it's tremendous. And, and, you know, he, 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 she, she's seeing all this. And then look at this. Then the ascent, the way he goes up. I like the way, it, the, the, the entryway by which he went up to the temple. So Solomon had his own private way, and then it opened into the public to go up to the house of God, the temple of God. And she's walking with him with all that train of people behind her, and they're walking up the way. Think of the most glorious place. I've been, look, I've been in palaces when I'm in Europe. I've been in palaces um, where it's, you know, the, the walls are gold and decked in gold and silver and the paintings and, and, and it's nothing compared to what Solomon walked in. And, and it's, it's so phenomenal as they're going up to the house, the temple of God. And the temple of God is the most glorious structure upon the face of the earth in those days. And there's nothing in the temple of God that is not gold. There's no silver. Even the walls are overlaid. The augman wood is overlaid with gold. Everything is gold. And the pillars and everything, the ornate, ornate workings, the, the two pillars outside are made of bronze of the most intricate work by the skilled craftsman. I mean, it just takes your, it's why it just took her breath away. And if it wasn't one thing to see one of his butlers dressed like a king, then you get outside and here's this entryway, these stairs and steps, and it opens up into the temple precinct. And it just takes her breath away. And there's the, there's the labor to wash in. And then there's the altar of sacrifice. You know, and it's all there. And Solomon has had it made. And it is the most glorious stuff that has ever been made upon the face of the earth up to that time. And it just takes her breath away. And the God who gives you breath wants to take your breath away. He wants you to see him and have your breath taken away. That you're so caught up with his majesty and his glory. Beloved, you won't look away. You see, the things that arise out of the earth that now distract so much of the church. You know, COVID and pandemonium in the streets. And let's see, we had killer hornets. And, uh, and then the Sierra dust storm that's coming. Uh, you know, the great... You think... That is nothing compared to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. My focus is on you, Lord. Lord, anoint me. Take me deeper. Lord, give me those gifts of revelation. Fill me, Lord, with those gifts of power, healing, deliverance, even the utterance gifts of prophecy, tongues interpretation. Glory. So here he is. Solomon, actually greater than Solomon. So just think of all this, and the one that we love and worship is greater than all. This. And you have to, she had to admit, verse 6, it's a true report. I heard it, and now I see it. And I didn't believe it, verse 7, until I came and I saw it, and the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame and beloved i want to tell you again that the half has not been shown nor told to the church of what's happened and what's coming because the lord is going to reveal himself to us the lord is coming as you you probably hear it for years the lord is coming to the church before he comes for her the lord is coming to the church before he comes for her. And so God is wanting us to pursue him. He's, he's wanting us to come from the ends of the earth. You know, the ends of the earth. You know, and, and, and instead of being caught up and watching four or five hours of TV, instead you're, you're in the book or you're in prayer. You know, and instead of whiling your ways around, and I'm saying you can't go fishing or you can't watch some TV or whatever. Uh, you, I'm just saying, man, there, there, there are Christians, you know, so many of our precious brothers and sisters, they just waste their lives on that stuff. Yeah. 
And then one day they're going to stand before the king. I had a brother share a vision. He was caught up to heaven. He actually, it was a sister in the Lord, and she was there, and the Lord was showing her portions of, she was caught up in vision like Paul. Think of Peter, you know, caught up and um, was showing her. And she happened to look to her right, and here came three gentlemen, and they were dressed, just dressed immaculately. And, and the Lord Jesus is talking to this young woman, and her, her attention got off on those guys. And immediately the Lord just turned and, and looked at him, and he walked right over. She, he left her and walked over to them. And, and what you want to do is you want to keep your attention on him because distractions come. And you want to so fix your heart on him that you're not distracted. And the thing about these three guys, one she said she recognized immediately as some kind of a famous evangelist or something or other, TV or something. And uh, he introduced, when he walked up to the Lord Jesus, he said something to the fact, well, here I am. And uh, the Lord wasn't impressed. Immediately the Lord said, what did you do for my people Israel? What did you do for my church? He said, well, I, I, I preached in your name. I cast out demons. I, I work miracles. I, yeah, I this and that. And the Lord said, said, what did you do for my people? And the Lord just went like this and walked away from him. And when he did that, they disappeared. You know, I hope that scares you in the right way. Because this, this loving Jesus we have, beloved, he, he, loves you to, he loves you so much he died for you yeah. and rose again for you. But, but the thing you don't want to do is don't trifle with him. Don't play games with him. If, if you're in sin, repent of it right now. Right where you sit, ask the Lord to forgive you. And he will. That's the beautiful thing. He will. But you don't, you don't want to trifle with the God of heaven, the creator of the universe. He wants you to walk with him in white. Remember how the Lord talks to those seven churches in the book of Revelation. He's talking to Christians there. He said, well, you've done this pretty good, but this, mm, this is not so good. He said, I have some here in Sardis who have been faithful to me, and they will walk with me in white. Not everybody in Sardis, but this group here. They will walk with me in white. So the Lord Jesus really talks plain. He loves us so much. He's a, he's a plain talker. And, and he's real. And, and he wants us to know him uh, as a real, real, real God who is involved every day in our lives. Because, you know, in him we live and we move and we have our existence, our being. And God so loves us that he has demonstrated that in the life of his son. So just going back, I want to wrap this up. Just going back, sit down and read this path. Meditate on it. Let, let the Lord show you both himself and his church in this passage. You notice here down in verse um, 8 and 9, you know, there the thing about being happy you know, here these men and women are able to sit at Solomon's feet, and you're able to sit at Jesus' feet if you want to. Mary did. And you can sit at his feet if you want to. And hear his wisdom. And she says, I love this. This is the Queen of Sheba, folks. She she is not an Israeli. She's not a Jew. I don't know if she knows the Lord or not. But this is the thing, the beautiful thing about the end time church. The ungodly are going to see all this. And this is what's going to come out of their mouths. Blessed be the Lord your God, which delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved his church forever. 
Therefore, he made you king to do judge and justice. And this is the end time church. This is a picture of her once again that the Lord is bringing forth into the earth. And it's going to be the most glorious church. This is why God is stirring as you hear about the different movements in the earth and the Lord restoring the church, uh, bringing her back and restoring, you know, the simplicity of her childlikeness. You know, just like those sweet little darlings over there running around and laughing and enjoying. They were happy, 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 you know, happy, happy. And the Lord is wanting to, to make you happy. You know, but first, he wants you to know he wants to make you holy. And if you're holy, then you'll be happy, right? Yes. And guess how that happens? He says, if you believe in me, he said, be holy for I am holy. So I've got to wear certain kind of clothes. How about a hairdo? Uh, What other religious thing do I have to do? Bow down and kiss somebody's ring. I I don't know. Folks, folks, the real God is real. You know, don't you love it when people are just real with you? They're just real with you. You know, they're not trying to hide things from you. And and this is the way our precious Lord is. Father, just take the simple message I brought this morning, Lord. Just, I pray you just would bless your people with it. And Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we, we are so thankful that the greater than Solomon is here. And Lord, we love you. And we're just asking you just to draw us ever closer. Lord, that, Lord, you just take our breath away. The half has not been told us about who you are, your glory, your majesty, your dominion, your righteousness, your love, your purity. Wow. Wow, what a God. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Man. Man, why don't you stand up? Hallelujah. Man, oh, man. The more I seek you,
If you want to surrender all to him today, come up front and let Pastor Jeff pray for you. He's calling you and you can feel it in your heart. Don't walk away from this moment. Don't walk away from this moment. He loves you. He'll do anything for you. He'll push to the ends of the earth for you. And he's calling you right now. He's calling you right now. He's calling you right now. Now I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe and feel your heart beat. This love is so deep, it's more than I can stand. Father in heaven, I melt in your peace, it's over with me. Oh, you're overwhelming. You overwhelming. You overwhelming. Just for me. And I want to see that your feet drink from the cup in your hand. Lay back against you and breathe and feel your heart beat. This love is so deep, Spirit. It's more than I can stand. In Jesus, I built in your peace. It's overwhelming. Daughter, I just thank you, Father. Oh, you overwhelm me. You overwhelm me. I break it. You overwhelm me. Your precious son. Let them walk before you. You overwhelm me. You overwhelm me. You overwhelm me. Amen and amen. He loves you. You know that? Amen. <laughs> amen. Well, let's rejoice. We got a couple of Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. We're cutting loose. Did you hear him? Man, oh man. Isn't that good? We'll make sure you all say hello to our brother, new brother and sister in Christ and love on them and uh, do each other good all week long and seek the Lord. Seek him while he may be found. Ooh, there's another scripture for you. You know, get after him. Get after him. He loves it. He's looking for you every morning. He's looking for you. So Father, bless your people as they go out of this place and let your spirit envelop them in your very heart. Keep them safe. Lord, thank you for the angelic guard about each and every one of them. And Lord, continue to release from heaven every good and perfect gift into their lives and to their hearts. We bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What a God. Man, be blessed. Have a great week. Praise the Lord. Man.